Stay informed about the latest democracy and voting rights news by clicking here to subscribe to Democracy Docket's daily and weekly newsletters. Secretaries of state play a crucial role in ensuring free and fair elections and accurate election results. Colorado Secretary of State Jenna Griswold is here to discuss the threats facing our elections this year and how she is fighting back. Welcome to Defending Democracy. I'm Mark Elias. Let's get started. Thank you for joining Defending Democracy, uh, Secretary of State Griswold. Of course. Thanks for having me. So I have to, you know, we're going to talk about a lot of uh, serious things uh today. But I have to start by something that, frankly, um, I came across that doesn't seem very serious, uh, which is uh, the Republicans in Colorado tried to impeach you. Uh, you're right in saying it wasn't very serious. Uh, so this is the fifth time in, we believe, Colorado's history since uh, a resolution for impeachment has been heard in the House. And the articles were really focused on me being a defendant in the Trump disqualification case, uh, my words saying that Trump was and is an insurrectionist. And then there was an allegation that Trump actually wasn't on our ballot, which was patently <laughs> false. So the, the whole thing was just political theater for the Republicans in the legislature. You know, the, the leader of this effort even admitted on uh, in an interview on video that it was about motivating their base. But ultimately, uh, they had witnesses that at times refused to say the insurrection actually happened. One witness who was an attorney in the Trump disqualifications case said there were no weapons at January 6th. It wasn't an insurrection. Maybe it was a coup. Uh, so the whole thing was just totally ridiculous, um, but it's behind us. I, I survived the resolution for impeachment 2024, uh, which was, a a, I, I think we should print out t-shirts. Absolutely. But it was a, a big waste of time. They wasted taxpayer money. And at the end of the day, um, we were able to underline that yes, indeed, January 6th happened uh, and Trump is a danger to our democracy. Yeah. So I want to start there. And, and first, so that everyone is clear, um, you know, the question of whether or not Donald Trump was an insurrectionist, I've said I, I think he is. Uh, but this was something the Colorado courts said. It's not like it's not like you invented this notion. I don't know if anyone pointed this out to the legislature, but uh, but it was actually the Colorado courts that determined that he uh, uh, had engaged in insurrection. And in fact, the U.S. Supreme Court didn't contradict that. So as far as I can tell, that that remains the the standing finding of fact uh, by the Colorado courts. Um, but I, so I just wanted to clarify, not that you needed defense on this point, but that, uh, <laughs> I think they're I think they're I think their complaint uh, goes beyond uh, goes beyond you. But you, mm -hmm. you point you point out that he remains a threat to democracy, and your job, of course, is to ensure that every eligible voter is able. Uh, to vote and have their votes counted and that those election results are accurate and that they're certified and that literally from sort of start to finish from the from voters, you know, registering and getting ballots to the certification runs smoothly. Um, how has the events of, you know, from January 6th forward to today, how, how has this made your job harder? Oh, it's changed everything, to tell you the truth. Um, and, and you are right to, to just comment a little further. Three courts have actually found that Donald Trump engaged in insurrection and the Colorado Supreme Court uh, said he was a, quote, oath breaking insurrectionist. And that yeah. oath breaking was important because of uh, the Section three of the 14th Amendment. But the, the larger picture is that, you know, when I ran for secretary of state, Donald Trump was already a threat to our democracy. I ran in 2017. And it just got worse and worse and worse every single year. Uh, we have seen Donald Trump, along with his MAGA allies, really attempt and, to, and be somewhat successful in destabilizing our democracy. The big lie and all the lies about elections have been used, as I, you talk about and, and fight every single day, has been used to suppress the vote, uh, attempts all across the country. We have seen the lies actually incite threats to our election infrastructure. Colorado had two insider threats where elected 
county clerks actually breached their own security protocols trying to prove conspiracies. And then, you know, the, the huge undermining of confidence, of course, and then a, a big one is the threat atmosphere to election workers, which has reached an all-time high. It has not stopped. And to an extent, it, it has been successful in scaring some election workers and election judges out of their jobs. Mm. Mm. And, and of course, the people who are scared out of their jobs are precisely the people you want to keep, right? Because these are the people who are trying to do everything, uh, do everything right. What do you think is going to happen? I don't mean who's going to win the election, but, you know, how are, how are you going to prepare? How should the public prepare for what we're going to see in 2024 because lord knows it's not getting better right it's not like it's not like the mega forces have receded in their attacks mm -hmm. on free and fair elections and they, they've just in, increased uh the attacks have grown uh, grown stronger uh, and they've become more mainstream which is I, I think really unfortunate you know there's two things uh, number one are the lies and how that makes running elections just so much harder from the very local level to the statewide level. Uh, we have to think about things like will House leadership certify the Electoral College and, and come up to plans um, both to running elections very localized and how that's harder to how we get through certification if, if Donald Trump loses. Um, but I, I think, you know, the attacks on democracy have also really backfired. We have seen election workers step down. County clerks in Colorado, 38% of them have stepped down since 2020, in part because of the, just the threat environment working in this uh, age of disinformation and lies. But the people who then ran for office know exactly what they're getting into. The new wave of secretaries of state that I fought really hard to, to get them elected in 2022 in those battleground states know exactly what the job is. You will face death threats. You will face threats to your election infrastructure. You have to deal with all these like crazy situations. They know that they're ready to go. So I do think election workers are, are really strong and resilient Republicans and Democrats. And then also how it has backfired is democracy is extremely motivating to Americans, including Republican and unaffiliated voters. That's why we're seeing that these extremists lose over and over and over again uh, in states or districts that are true swing states or in swing districts. Yeah. So let me ask you a couple of Colorado specific uh, questions. The first is, you know, I remember when Colorado moved to uh, be vote by mail. And at the time, it was a bipartisan effort. Um, and you saw, by the way, Republicans and Democrats candidates both succeed under vote by mail. You know, I, I oftentimes point out that uh, Senator Udall lost his uh, Senate election uh, after there was vote by mail, a Democratic incumbent senator. Um, and all of a sudden, one day, Donald Trump, in seemingly out of the blue, sort of announced uh, uh, that he hated vote by mail and that it was he started spreading lies about it. And I'm just curious. I've been meaning I've been wanting to ask you this um, when you're in a state that has had such a successful history with vote by mail on a bipartisan basis. You know, I know it like it infects states, you know, where vote by mail is relatively less used. But have you seen that also infect the atmosphere Republicans bring to vote by mail in Colorado, or is it still sort of even in, you know Republicans in Colorado they still they still defend vote by mail? Well, that, that's a great question, and actually, um, vote by mail for all was passed into law in 2013. Uh, the then Secretary of State, who I actually ran against, opposed it, but he did a really good job implementing a great system. 2014 rolls around and the only Democrat who wins or survives statewide uh, was the then Governor Hickenlooper. The, the Republicans took all the statewide seats. So vote by mail doesn't help one side or the other. It just makes it a lot more accessible and secure for voters to cast a ballot. It saves states a ton of money. It's a lot cheaper to administer a vote by mail for all election, even when you have in-person voting. Um, but I, I'm, you know, was very cognizant about the, the very direct attacks from President Trump on Colorado's electoral system. We have vote by mail, uh, weeks of early voting, same day voter registration. 
and Coloradans really do like vote by mail. And I, you know, was really worried that we'd see a big drop off of Republican participation with vote by mail. Mark, to tell you the truth, we saw the opposite. The last election, we just had uh, uh, the presidential primary. So that was a Super Tuesday presidential primary. 98.5% of voters who cast a ballot voted their mail ballot. Mm -hmm. And there was a big shift prior to 2020 and after. Uh, when I first became Secretary of State, the rough numbers were about 75% of voters would use their mail ballots. That went uh, since 2020 up to 98, 99%. And I think there's two reasons. Number one, the pandemic, people didn't want to go vote in person, even though we, we had in-person voting open. But number two, to take us back to the, the dark days of 2020, Remember DeJoy was trying to slow down mail processing to make it harder for mail ballot states. And I actually had to sue DeJoy. He sent out bad information in the state of Colorado. Uh, we uh, agreed to a restraining order. I, I had the authority to sign off on all the postal services, notices across the country on voting. But I, I think the pandemic plus um, what DeJoy was doing in 2020 really pushed uh, just got Coloradans to vote their mail ballot. And even though we do have the voter suppression attempts from uh, Republicans in our House targeting vote by mail, they're not successful. And Colorado is tied actually for number one with Oregon for the highest degree of confidence in our elections in the entire country. It's really something to watch um, the duality of, you know, the states that have either made universal vote by mail or made it strongly encouraged or widely available, it's a sort of sliding scale. Um, the, the disconnect between the satisfaction rates of the voters versus the rhetoric that comes out of um, Republicans. Um, I can't uh, uh, move on from some sort of somewhat local Colorado uh, politics uh, by noting that John Eastman, um, the now infamous, uh, uh, indicted, uh, <laughs> disgraced, I don't know what the right uh, 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 word to use is. Uh, John Eastman has been disbarred um, for his, uh, effort, his involvement uh, in attempts to overturn the 2020 elections. And he claims he needs to keep his law license uh, to earn a living, uh, um, uh, to pay the legal fees. And one of the lawsuits that he claims he needs to be continued to be involved in uh, is a lawsuit in Colorado. So, um, and, and by the way, people may not realize it, but John Eastman was based in Colorado after the 2020 election uh, when he wrote the now infamous memos trying to overturn the mm -hmm. outcome of the election. Uh, election. So I'm just curious uh, what your reaction is to uh, 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 to the fact that John Eastman wants to continue practicing law uh, and uh, be be active in your courts in election cases. It's laughable. It's laughable. Eastman, what can you say? Um, I'm an attorney. You're an attorney. We swear to uphold the Constitution um, of our states, of the United States. Eastman was working to try to steal the presidency. He then engaged in so much misinformation. Uh, he's been uh, counsel for the Colorado Republican Party, the leader of whom is an election denier and has filed various lawsuits to try to disenfranchise Colorado voters. Oh, so the he's a most, repeat player in Colorado. He's a repeat player, yeah. Uh, in, not only in lawsuits, in 2022, I think January or February, a far-right group with a militia arm held a rally. Uh, one of the uh, election deniers leading the movement called for me to be hung. Eastman was on stage when that happened. So it's not only the, the legal spirits, the, the far right political uh, that we've seen in Colorado too, but anyhow, um, his current litigation that he's representing the Colorado Republican party is trying to disenfranchise 50% of our electorate. We have a, a primary system where unaffiliated voters can vote either in the Republican primary or democratic primary. Uh, and what they are trying to do is to close those primaries down so unaffiliated can't vote in the party primaries. 
over 50% of Colorado voters are unaffiliated voters. It just strikes me that if you were the Colorado Republican Party, who has, by the way, a pretty infamous history, they are also responsible for some of the um, attacks on the federal campaign finance laws uh, that went to the U.S. Supreme Court. But is there literally no other lawyer you could find other than a guy who's currently under indictment? Uh, that's a great question for them. But when you have uh, the leadership of the Colorado Republican Party endorsed by Donald Trump, he's running for Congress. Uh, he uh, formerly, I think, was the state director or something like that for Trump. He, he's a straight out election denier. That's wow. his plan. Uh, he so Coloradans really know who Tina Peters is. She uh, compromised her own voting equipment. Uh, they've commended her. They've put her on a pedestal saying she's in charge of uh, election integrity. It's an unserious party uh, that hires unserious people, um, including Eastman, who is, is more than unserious. He's a danger to our democracy and he should be absolutely uh, disbarred. There is no reason that attorneys should remain in practice who are working against the United States Constitution. Amen. I agree with you entirely about that. And uh, uh, it is a it is a sign of the problem that we have in this country, the, the threat to democracy that, as you point out, there's just one party that's just completely unserious about about governing. They're not serious about free and fair elections. And it is ultimately a hard place to be where you have a system where at any given election, you know, one candidate doesn't want there to be accurate elections. Um, yeah. So I want to pivot to your role as the chair of a very, very important organization. Uh, you are the chair of the Democratic Association of Secretaries of State, um, uh, which, as you you sort of alluded to earlier, among other things, uh, is responsible for making sure these election deniers don't win. That you know that that you. But but part of the challenge that I think you have is you kind of have to run the table, right? Like, it's not like, you know, in Congress, I, I want Democrats to take control of Congress and the House and keep control of the Senate. But like, you can have like a, a, some number of election deniers and it's not mission critical. You really can't have any secretaries of state being election deniers without it being a, a real problem. So talk about your job, uh, your other job mm -hmm. <laughs> as, uh, as the chair of DAS. That's right. Um, you know, there are still really great Republicans at the local level. In Colorado, the majority of our, the, the, I would say the super majority of our county clerks are Republicans. They are dedicated to doing the job of serving democracy. But we have seen this extremism and the loyalty to Trump really infect statewide office holders and, and uh, folks running statewide races. And I became chair of the Democratic Association of Secretaries of State right around the time of the insurrection. The committee, uh, it's, it's basically uh, the DNC committee for secretaries of state. It didn't have any staff. Uh, it hadn't raised all that much money uh, in the past. And suddenly we were faced with the prospect in 2022 that the Republican nominees for nearly every single swing state secretary of state race were election deniers. Yeah. They were people who did not believe in free and fair elections. They did not believe in the right to vote. And ultimately um, just thinking through, well, what would happen if there was an election denier in Michigan or Nevada or Arizona overseeing the statewide elections? Uh, they could put their thumb on, on the scale of things in, in such a tremendous way. And ultimately, it should be up to the American people to decide who their president is, not a bunch of corrupt, you know, out there politicians. So I love the, the unprecedented effort last year. Uh, we had a lot of tremendous support, including from you and, and many other people who chipped in. Uh, we were able to, to raise a budget of $32 million dollars. We needed every single dollar and we stopped election deniers in secretary of state positions in Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Nevada, Arizona, uh, and um, New Mexico. So her, just great wins. With that said, there are election denier secretaries of state and it's a travesty. 
they're in places that we may not be able to win um, by running a Democrat. And what we saw last cycle is even moderate Republicans were primaried from the far right. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the moderates lost their jobs. It's a really concerning situation, but I am so glad that we had that unprecedented support last cycle so that one of these you know, election denying secretaries of state will not be able to swing the presidential election in a battleground state. Yeah. And just so everyone knows, you know, I follow politics closely at the federal level, the state level, at all levels. And there was no committee that had a better night in 2022 than DAS. I mean, they literally not just ran the table, but they ran the table in some really, really hard places. I mean, yeah. you know, you know, people think, OK, well, Jocelyn Benson was probably going to be OK. That's probably true. But, you know, I remember people talking about that, that that the secretary of state's race in Nevada was probably too far gone, that we were going to lose Nevada, that Arizona was very, very, very on razor's edge, that, that um, as you point out, Wisconsin, that Republicans had a scheme in Wisconsin and they thought they were going to win Wisconsin. So so these were, you know, and those are just a handful of the ones. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the night that DAS had rivals anyone, uh, rivals any uh, committee. And it just shows how, um, how, what a great job um, uh, uh, you did, your team did, and you Thank were you. able to utilize the money that, that you raised. So I hope people will continue to support. Uh, Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, and Mark, I, I, I would just say the amount of money we raised to support elections statewide is less than one side of a competitive Senate races. Absolutely. So in the grand scheme of, of things, it is a lot of money, but it's not a lot of money to win competitive races. And I just underline that because I, I think a lot of times, um, you know, nothing, nothing against the DC class, Mark, but the DC class and, and the national pundits bet against the American people. But the American people know right from wrong. They know what's fair and unfair. That's why they care so much about democracy. So if good people running for secretary of state have enough to be able to just paint the picture, look, the guy I'm running against or the girl I'm running against uh, wants to take away your right to vote. Uh, and I'm there to, to make sure that everybody has free and fair elections. It makes all the difference. And I think we'll continue to see democracy uh, be a really big motivating force this election. Good. Well, I want to um, focus a few minutes on, um, as you said, unfortunately, there are places that do not have um, pro-democracy secretaries of state. Um, and, you know, I, I noticed that um, what we've seen among the governors, if you look at the National Governors Association, it's it's really suffered because the Republican governors are so crazy. They really don't even want to deal, have anything to do with the sensible Democratic governors. There used to be so much camaraderie. Is there any bipartisanship left or is it really just like you have the MAGA secretaries of state? And 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 you just have to go your own way and work with other Democrats and maybe the Republic, the one off Republican here or there. Yeah, I think that's a really good description of where we're at. There are a, a couple um, reasonable Republicans left out there, but it's fewer and far between than even in 2020. If we think about 2020, remember a lot of Trump's lies were still being contested by uh, some Republicans. We had the insurrection, the Republicans in Congress denounce it. And it wasn't until months later that we started to see this rewriting of history, that suddenly Donald Trump and all his crazy conspiracies are, are somehow right. And that really uh, is, is true with what happened with Republican secretaries of state. Republican secretaries of state in general are way more extreme than they were in 2020 or the beginning of 2021. Uh, you have folks who just spout complete and total nonsense. Uh, our last secretary of state meeting in DC in, in uh, February, the West Virginia secretary of state, I think, said that the FBI and CIA stole uh, the 2020 election. It's, it's just nonsense. So there's a, a little bit of bipartisan work. I will tell you the Democrats are really close 
because not all of us go through these horrendous situations, but it's, it's really hard to explain what it means to have your life and your family's life continuously threatened for doing your job. And it's so atypical in this country to have to live like that, that those experiences from threats to our election infrastructure, to ourselves, to our staff, voter suppression attempts, have really brought us all together and made us stronger, uh, which I think is crucial to get through 2024. Yeah. So I have to ask you, um, uh, before we go, um, I remember when Eric was created and Colorado was one Mm -hmm. of the founding members of Eric. Eric, for people who don't know, is a consortium of states, historically Democratic and Republican, very bipartisan, that um, run essentially an interstate exchange, information exchange. So that if someone moves, you know, if I move to Colorado, uh, uh, the Colorado uh, data, uh, voter database will be like, hey, we now have Mark Elias here. It would communicate with the prior place. I'd be removed. It's actually, and I've described this several times, it is not exactly like a, a, a liberal dream. Like this, there was a lot in Eric for conservatives who claimed that what they really wanted were clean voter rolls, right? It makes sure that as people move within states or between states, there is routine list maintenance to make sure that people are properly removed, not improperly removed. And also that there's, there are voter registration efforts to make sure that people stay, uh, people can, can stay um, uh, registered. Um, All of a sudden we wake up one day and not that long ago in the last, you know, year or so, and Republican secretary of states are pulling themselves out of Eric, which I just scratch my head because all they're going to wind up with is is less accurate voter rolls. Like literally the thing that they claim that they care most about is the thing that they are doing by pulling out of Eric. They are going to lead to more people on their voter rolls who they're not going to vote. It's not going to lead to voter fraud, right? These people have moved or or died or whatever. It's not, it's not a fraud thing, but it leads to these, these voter roll things that Republicans claim they care so much about. I've heard, I've asked various people this. Some say it was a conspiracy theory, weren't run amok. Uh, some people think, no, 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 it's intentional because Republicans want an excuse later to claim, you know, that these voter rolls were problematic. What do you make of this? Like, what do you, what, it literally makes no sense. What do you make of their all of a sudden declaring war on what is it, what should be a good government, a place where good government on the left and the, fever dreams, uh, nightmares of Republicans on the right meet up. It just shows how hypocritical uh, Republican secretaries of state and MAGA Republicans are. Uh, it, you know, conspiracies did start moving about Eric. Uh, initially, the Republican secretaries of state stood firm. That really crumbled within weeks. And it's so ridiculous because if your top concern is double voting, there is no widespread double voting in this country, but it happens here here and there. And if your top concern is going after double voting, well, then your top tool is Eric, because we are not only um, not only is it an avenue to make sure our voting rolls are, are really clean, Uh, which from a a good governance perspective just means you're saving money, Um, ballots aren't going out to the wrong people, it it increases our security. But not only does Eric help states uh, have really clean voter rolls, it sends us a report after the election if there was any suspected double voting. A lot of times those reports are wrong. Uh, You know, it's people with the same names living in different states. It's uh, a junior and a senior in the same family. But I'll tell you, in Colorado, we investigate them all. So the Republicans giving up that information, uh, it just shows that they don't care about security. They don't care about clean voter rolls. All they care about is their petty pursuit of political power. And when the far right conspiracies say something is bad, they start to parrot, this is bad, and it has real policy consequences. And the the last thing I will say about this general topic, that one of the things that is so frustrating, working with, uh, you know, election denier Republicans, mega Republicans, 
is that they just fabricate things. Going back to this um, articles of impeachment hearing that I faced yesterday, the Republicans in the state legislature literally alleged that Donald Trump was not on our ballot. <laughs> I brought a ballot in and pointed to where he was. And then one of the Republican legislators asked me about the hundreds of thousands of people who voted for Trump. And it's like, well, which one is it? Was Trump not on the ballot ballot or did a half a million people plus vote for him? And you, you're, it's just like you're talking in a, a backwards world and it underlines none of this is about the truth. None of this is about good policy. It's about undermining the truth. So no one quite knows what's happening to create an opening for folks who want to try to steal elections to give them a better shot at that. And that's un-American. It's undemocratic. Uh, and it's just unimaginable it's happening in this country right now. Okay, I gotta ask this one last question. Yeah. Um, so you face uh, death threats. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're being lied about constantly. Uh, your legislature, the Republicans in the legislature are trying to, uh, you know, uh, vilify you for no good reason. Um, you oversee a process that is vital to democracy, but whereas you point out, you know, lo the local folks who you help recruit and support and work with, they're, they're under constant pressure and, and attack. Um, why is this work so important to you <laughs> that, that you, that you keep doing it? I mean, do yeah. you ever think like, you know what, it's just not worth it. Yeah, I don't, you, you know, to tell you the truth. I, I think some people do. And that's why we've seen people step down from these positions. You know, honestly, Mark, I, I think it's how I grew up. I, I grew up in a cabin with an outhouse outside on food stamps in rural Colorado. I started working the summer after seventh grade. My mom worked two jobs uh, for most of my childhood. And the reason I even went to college, I'm first in my family to go to college, let alone uh, law school to a four-year college, was that I, I just thought it was unfair how much Colorado families had to struggle like mine. And I think about people that I grew up with. Um, I, I think about people who are, are trying to get by. And I know that a, a strong man who does not believe in the law and try to, tries to dismantle democracy is bad for us all. We know our fundamental freedoms are at complete risk. Uh, women have been degraded to second-class citizens in this country. We are seeing what happens when you strip uh, away fundamental freedoms. Trump just said, okay, uh, abortion is up to the states. What happens is Arizona. There is now basically an abortion ban that puts women's lives at risk, uh, puts uh, fertility at risk. And ultimately, it, it's just going to lead to just suffering if we don't have a, a, a strong democracy. That's what motivates me. I also know that I'm on the wrong, on the right side of history like you, and that people know that. The loudest voices sometimes are the most extreme voices, but I just won re-election by 13 points. That's somewhat unheard of in the state of Colorado for my seat. Heck, I won, I'm the first Democrat to win in 60 years. People care about democracy, Republicans do, Democrats do, unaffiliated do at, at the, the voting level. And we, we need folks to stand up in times like this. I really appreciate your leadership. You have accomplished so much with your team of holding the line and we just need every American to stand up. And I am actually really optimistic we're gonna get through this year stronger and election deniers are gonna have big losses and we'll be able to start really fortifying American democracy. Well, from your mouth to God's ears, and, uh, <laughs> thank you for everything you have done for Colorado. Thank you for everything you've done for Democrats uh, running for Secretary of State. And thank you for everything you've done for democracy. It's not just the work you do uh, to help uh, uh, your colleagues and work with your colleagues, but everywhere I go, everywhere I go, people say, what an amazing job you are doing. Everywhere I go, Thank people you. say you are the future of the Democratic Party and uh, the future of democracy protection in this country. So thank you for being with us today and good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for listening to Defending Democracy. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a review. 
And to find out more and stay up to date on the latest voting rights and election news, visit democracydocket.com and subscribe to our daily and weekly newsletters. We'll see you next time. Today's episode was produced by Ali Rothenberg, Gabriel Corporal, and Paige Moskowitz, who was edited by Gabriel Corporal and Paige Moskowitz. Defending Democracy is a production of Democracy Docket, LLC.